What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 216 at block height 626,589 on Saturday, April 18th. So, guys, um, Rick, Janine, I have been ignoring all the briefings and, and all that stuff. So, what am I supposed to be mad about that Orange Man said this week? Jeez, I don't. Come on, you, got, you guys no got to feed it to me. I, I haven't been watching. Me neither. Like, I was just taking some of my CBD pill mints just because I need to chill out, you know? There's just been so much going on. I'm trying to think, like, what has happened in the past, you know, week? It's just been incredible as far as, you know, developments in the world of privacy and Bitcoin as well as in just the world of you know, Bitcoin and crypto and all of this stuff that's going on. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot that's been going on, a lot to distract myself away from all the Rick? realities of COVID and everything. But uh, Rick, yeah, I need are to you down. saying that voluntarily? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's no threat. I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. No, I'm doing okay. I just need to calm down a little bit. Been trying to keep up with the news. Like I was saying, there's a lot going on and been running down on the desk and there's just so much to cover. But uh, yeah, I'm doing well. How are you doing, Janine? Uh, well, according to my Twitter notifications, I have been uh, enlisted as a signer of the De Declaration of Monetary Independence um, I have not read this document, and I didn't even know it existed, but apparently I'm a signer, so I guess this is what it feels like to, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm a founding mother or something. Interesting. I thought, you know, signing was an interactive thing, you know, where you actually had to do something and, and know about it. Yeah, I guess. But then again, John Hancock's name became the uh, term for a signature, so his name basically got taken, so who knows. Put the old J-9 on the Declaration of Monetary Independence. I'll be. I think I'm on there, too. This is what happens when you're in a decentralized ecosystem. You just get used sometimes. So, nah. But That's weird. It's all for the greater good. I would I mean, lose I'm... my shit if somebody put my name on something without telling or asking me. Your name's I, on it, I, buddy. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if my name is anywhere. I just got added to a list, and when John Carvalho asked what the list was for, it was about the signers of the Declaration of Monetary Independence. It sounds interesting, so I'm not opposed to it. I just don't know what it is, but I would like to actually see this thing that. Uh, I signed, um, and according to uh, another person, I think I saw my notifications, they said that if the founders had been anonymous, the Declaration of Independence probably wouldn't have been as uh, influential, but uh, different times. Right, and definitely, yeah, some odd coordination there, because yeah, the way that I saw it was just like a list of pictures of a bunch of people that somebody put together and then somebody said that's the list of people in the Declaration of Monetary Theory or Independence or something and then somebody else decided to write the document. So I mean, I, the way that it looks, it doesn't look like any one person decided that this was going to be a thing, it's just the community doing something. It's well, pretty fun. And what's even more confusing is I think the list was, at, the lists were added to a thread about um, Something about stitching people's faces into, I don't know, someone is apparently making a quill. Right, a quill. And I don't, that's, I don't know, I can't confirm this, but that's what it sounds like. So apparently my uh, 
my redheaded girl trapped in a uh, moth room is going to be on a quilt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the world and the universe we live in is incredible. Do, 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 do. Yeah, so uh, getting into all this incredible universe, one of the major things that happened this week was the development of some privacy, which did bring in a lot of drama. But there's a lot of tech to talk about here. So, uh, Chino, why don't you run us down the big story that dropped? Drama, drama, drama. So, um, I wish I could say this was unpredictable, but I can't. Um, so Mr. Cox uh, from BTC Pay Server uh, with funding from Blockstream has implemented uh, Pay to Endpoint or Pay Join in BTC Pay. And, uh, you know, this is a pretty awesome thing because this, this whole technique of pretty much creating a coin join that you can't tell is a coin join to make a payment, it's been around for two years, but not nothing has implemented it like uh bust a bit a gambling site made an implementation join market um samurai has their um stowaway set up for this but nothing was really compatible and there was nothing rolled into a widely used merchant uh suit or suite so ba-boom um, BTC pay has exploded in the past year or two in terms of small merchants out there and some actual corporations. I think cheap air actually uses their own BTC pay instance, um, to accept Bitcoin. And now that software suite seamlessly supports using a pay to endpoint implementation, which is pretty awesome. And I think um, Green, uh, Blockstream Green is going to be implementing it. Wasabi is going to be implementing it. I think I saw Blue Wallet, the Lightning uh, wallet that I'm not very fond of, is going to implement it. And, you know, it's this actually puts some momentum behind it. Um, you know, people can receive with it now. There's a reason for all these wallets to implement it. And sadly... Um, Samurai, rather than look at this or consider the possibility of modifying their implementation of pay to endpoint to be compatible with this, um, just had a 12 year old meltdown hissy fit and started screaming about how they implemented stowaway years ago. And they're not going to make it compatible with anything else because our privacy is perfect and everybody else's shit stinks. And it's been a huge fucking shit show and drama point going on, which is just absolutely fucking absurd. Like, I seriously never thought I would, I would see the day in this space where a major project implements a privacy technique and people just have a meltdown and a hissy fit and just scream, look at what I did that doesn't work with anybody else's protocol or anyone else's software years ago. Re, And it's frankly kind of fucking sad and pathetic that that's the response to privacy tools being built into more things for people to have more choices and more ways to actually use or access those privacy tools. That's the response. That's pathetic. That is, that is literally the most childish thing I have ever seen in this space. And the reality is, okay, go be children. Um, this is going to happen now. We're going to see how many wallets out there fucking actually implement this. And the beauty of it is we will never know how many people are using this we will never know metrics on how widely adopted this is and that's the whole point it will break assumptions that chain analysis companies use to surveil people and we will never know how many people are using it that's the point so really um i just want to say this this is a fucking awesome push forward 
for lowest hanging fruit in terms of privacy issues being dealt with widely. And, you know, let, let's fucking actually use this. Let's roll this out. Like I'm going to be implementing this on a, or not implementing, um, installing on me and Mr. Hoddle's pay server soon. You know, Blockstream Green is going to be supporting this on the, the user side soon. Let's get this shit out there and start using it. I mean, I'm sorry, isn't, isn't the whole samurai tagline, um, build things and use things, stop LARPing? Well, I mean, I think that's only part of, at least from their perspective, that was only part of the reason why they were upset. The other thing that I saw Samurai saying from the limited amount that I read, because honestly, this stuff just makes me sad and I don't want to read it. Um, they were saying that they had issues with what Samson Mao was saying about, you know, coin join versus pay join and which one is better and how... Coin join is deficient in some way, and they didn't agree with. I don't remember exactly what they said, but it sounded like they didn't agree with the shade that was being cast on coin joins and, you know, differentiating them in ways that were implying that, you know, something about it is like it's associated with criminal activity or something. That was the impression that I got, but I honestly. Wow. I read that as um, you're whining that somebody thinks that coin joins have a, a bad, um, you know, view to them. Um, I don't know. Grow up, baby. Um, aren't they the team who literally just spent the past six months or so screaming about the competition getting flagged because these exchanges do look at things like this? Um, pick your narrative, buddy. Yeah, I saw that exact same thing, and like you're saying, Janine, I feel the same way. Like, I almost, I try to just scroll past this stuff, and it's really kind of bittersweet when these big developments happen in privacy in Bitcoin, because we do get this, like, narratives that come out about coin joins, and uh, it's just upsetting whenever you put so much effort into this, and whenever I see guys like, the team over at Samurai putting so much work and effort into all this and they take that sort of narrative and stance and yeah, you know, like maybe they're just being like really like, well, it's, it wasn't our name on it. So, well, we're not, we're upset. It's to me, it's like, I just question why are you putting that much motivation towards developing Bitcoin privacy? If you're the one that's looking into the background of this. And yeah, I just really call into a lot of question and I really am supportive of anybody that's trying to audit that repo and trying to ensure that that whole project is up to speed because it really draws into a lot of questions in my mind and the whole market's mind. And, um, you know, that's that's their their prerogative and they do what they do. You do that. And BTC Pay Server and Blockstream did a great thing here by standardizing these pay to endpoint transactions and making this argument kind of null and void. So much so to the point to where like we've seen people we hadn't seen in years come around all of a sudden questioning what's going on with this. And uh, it's a big freaking deal and it's something that's a great thing for the network overall. But these like bitter squabbles of like uh, whose name is attached to something is just it's just real upsetting whenever this could be very advanced it's very positive for the network to where we don't have this argument about tank going forward and we could just we could actually develop with fungibility in bitcoin on its base layer Mm -hmm. Also, I'd be curious to know, because obviously this was, I mean, they haven't all implemented it yet, but a number of wallets have kind of coordinated statements saying that they will. So to me, I get the impression that there was some background talk before this announcement today. And I don't know, maybe like... I haven't seen them say, I haven't, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see Samurai say that they wouldn't implement it. Maybe part of the anger is because they weren't involved in those conversations. I really don't know because honestly, the, the amount of like the history of bickering is too long to follow for me. So I don't know what kinds of like personal squabbles are going on here, but 
Yeah, I mean, the only good thing that I've seen come out of this today is that I guess the Human Rights Foundation is going to be using a BTC Pay server with with this pay join implementation to accept Bitcoin, so that's cool, but everything else just feels really gross. It's it's pretty much just butthurt <clears throat> that they uh they aren't in the spotlight. Like they have a, a pay join implementation. All they have to do to implement this is make it compatible with this in terms of the peer negotiation. But um, have they but actually they said that they wouldn't? Yes, they won't because our privacy is perfect and everybody else's shit stinks. But, you know, that's, that's the point. This is an incredibly low-hanging fruit that does not require a user to actively go out of their way to specifically maximize their individual privacy to gain a degree of privacy for themselves and to create a degree of privacy for everybody. And it should be implemented as widely as possible and as cross compatible as possible. And it's like, this isn't a perfect solution. You know, um, anybody can go listen to uh, the special edition we did with Ben Woosley who was working on um, a snowball framework to implement pay to endpoint and, and everything, kind of have that in a library that wallets could just integrate. And it's, it's not a perfect solution. You know, there, there are still patterns that might emerge out of this that you can get some information from if it's widely adopted. But it's, it's an improvement from how things are now. And it's something that you can just widely bake into everything. Like what is the motive there to just get butt hurt and start flinging shit as opposed to awesome, good. Like what, why, why is that a bad thing? Yeah, I, I, don't... I don't think I've seen them say that this is a bad thing in and of itself. It looks like they're angry about how it, how it was, introduced how it was announced and it sounds like they weren't somehow weren't involved in whatever coordination was going on with like going around asking wall or talking to other wallets and seeing if they could be compatible like it might just be that they would be willing to be or they were willing to be compatible but they just weren't part of the conversation like no i don't know they've outright said that they made their implementation specifically incompatible with everything else. And frankly, they weren't approached in conversations. That's on them. Like, seriously, I, I was a big fan of that project. I still think that that project has its strengths despite its weaknesses. But on a personal level, they act like pissy 12-year-old children over everything. The, the fact that they weren't part of this conversation is on nobody but them well to be honest from my point of view there are a lot of pissy 12 year old children in this conversation like a lot of these people can be pissy 12 year olds occasionally like it's not a one-sided thing on this issue it is because from their part it's a constant never ceasing thing with anybody who doesn't exactly agree with them on everything I mean, like, this was just such a big shock to me because, yeah, this was something that people were discussing about standardizing across LN channel settlement, like where the Lightning Network, where the channel settlement would be done through pay to endpoint. And they could just further obfuscate that layer and make Lightning even more private. And that's just something that was discussed in development. So whenever this pay to endpoint was implemented through a merchant service like BTC Pay Server, well, that just like makes a lot of sense as far as standardizing something that's widely spread across the network already. Somebody like Russell from, uh, you know, that Chicago from the Chargers from the NFL, he's promoting BTC Pay Server, and like BTC Pay Server is a big name. And like, whenever this came out, I was like, wow, this is great for BTC Pay Server. I haven't heard their name, but maybe one or two times since this announcement because of this craziness. Yeah, and that's where it's like this is upsetting. The people that are doing the work aren't even getting the credit because somebody else needs to be in the limelight, and it's upsetting. Yeah, I mean, dude, look at this. Like, seriously, I yeah, I don't think I've actually talked about pay to endpoint itself. 
really what that is. This is all the drama surrounding it. And it's so fucking stupid. Like, this is a good thing. Like, you can break the common input ownership heuristic using this. You fuck up one of the big assumptions that chain analysis companies use to really track flows of money on the chain. Like, this is a fucking awesome thing. And the fact that it's in BTC pay and not a privacy specific tool is why this actually has a chance to just become a universal thing in wallets across the space to be something widely used by everybody and not just a small niche of people who will dig through all of the bullshit and shit flinging regarding privacy in this space. And seriously, like there are so few people working on this that it does make me question why you're putting so much effort into it whenever you are stifling the ones that are working on this, where it's like, I mean, like seriously, last year I stepped away from this podcast and a lot of that had to do with a lot of the background noise on this. And it's just a very big background stress and it's upsetting. And it just makes me question, what are you, what's the goal? Like I get, like we are all trying to solve this big equation about Bitcoin privacy. And it's good to have parallel development teams and teams that, you know, are working in different modes. But like, guys, just like see a big win and like let other people win sometimes. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, though. I think we beat this one to death. So... Just a real quick mention to get my extra shill check. Um, Blockstream has recently created a research page on their site um, where they've collected all the different uh, research papers that employees have developed while they were at Blockstream over the years. So anybody looking for a large stack of white papers to read through, uh, check that out. But Janine, do you want to go into some of the uh, inner contradictions of people who surveil Bitcoiners' brains? Yeah, so um, Peter McCormick recently published an interview with the co-founder of Chainalysis, uh, Jonathan Levin. And um, because Chain Analysis, Chainalysis, I keep... Honestly terrible name because pe I, everyone I hear, they say chain analysis because that's what the name looks like. But anyway, he uh, made a number of interesting statements and Peter um, at the start of the episode made very clear that he like wasn't a fan of the company and didn't really believe any of the claims that Jonathan made. But I still think it was an interesting interview to listen to because chain analysis doesn't they don't have too much of a public face. They don't, you know, they don't, other than the webinars that Nopara was attending and reporting on, which were in many ways hilarious, uh, in many ways wrong. <laughs> um, they, you know, they don't talk much. We don't hear much from the individuals working there. And in fact, you know, a lot of their partners, a lot of their clients are kind of, secret or at least they try to keep it that way and a lot of the employees there don't make it public that they work there so some of the claims that he made that i thought were worth highlighting um first of all he started off by saying that they are motivated to prevent cyber crime and save children um great uh, how exactly do you do that uh because at no point did he give examples. He made another statement later on saying, like, through chain analysis, many lives have been saved. Um, I would really like to get some background on that because I haven't, you know, they should do a webinar on that about the lives that they've saved. Or, I mean, obviously there might be privacy concerns if you're dealing with children, but you could at least, you know, mention something because I literally have no idea that this software was so powerful that it was saving children. Um, so they also claimed that they do not collect KYC information from any of their customers um, being their clients, as in they claim that they don't access KYC information from the exchanges and other financial institutions or services that they may work with. Um, he also made the claim that he thinks privacy and crime fighting are well balanced in Bitcoin. Um, I don't know exactly what he meant by that because I think 
if I remember correctly, Peter's question was uh, about whether whether blockchain surveillance and privacy are at odds with each other. And he replied by saying that they're balanced. Um, I don't know about that, but let's continue. Uh, again, later on, he said, through chain analysis, many lives have been saved, wasn't able to cite any examples. Um, and when Peter brought up the fact that he got into Bitcoin because he needed to buy medication for his mother who had cancer, um, and he was saying, like, would your system flag me as a criminal or am I flagged in your system as a criminal? Um, Jonathan said, we don't flag criminal activity. We flag activity. We don't make criminal determinations, which is a very interesting statement to make because if you read any of their promotional material they say that you know their work their research uh their data is is you know has been cited in criminal investigations like i don't if if the main client, uh, clientele of your company is using your product for criminal prosecutions and investigations you, your software is making criminal determinations. Maybe it's not you, it's your software. It's your software saying this activity is suspicious. Why is it suspicious? Well, it was connected to an organization or individual user who, you know, had a connection to an organization that has been determined to be criminal. So you are making criminal determinations. You're assuming that connections through coins imply that those people who are using those coins or own those coins are part of the criminal activity. That is the whole point of your software is to make criminal determinations, to pass on criminal responsibility through the flow of coins and tracking the flow of coins. So how can you say that you don't make criminal determinations? The most, uh, now of course they're not law enforcement. So yes, they're not prosecuting anyone. They're just building the software that tells prosecutors who they should prosecute and how much. Because like, if your software is being cited in investigations, it's, it's helped them come to some conclusion about criminal activity. Like, otherwise, what is the point of your software? Why are governments using it? Why are they using it for criminal prosecution other than that? But probably the most interesting claim that he made, um, because Peter asked him about, like, you know, were, are there any countries that you wouldn't work with? How do you choose which countries or which governments in which countries you would work with? And of course... They're a U.S. company, so he said anyone on the sanctions list is off limits. And if sanctions are, you know, tightened, or it, even if there aren't any sanctions, and there's a country that's not particularly friendly with the U.S. government, um, then they would probably not work with them. And I think Peter asked him directly about uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, and even though Turkey is a bit uh, in a bit of hot water with the U.S. government. Um, he was saying uh, that they wouldn't be able to work with Turkey, but they would be willing to work with Saudi Arabia, though he caveated that by saying, like, it would depend on which section of Saudi Arabia. Like, are you talking about certain parts of the Saudi Arabian government? Are you talking about Saudi Arabian companies? But, yeah. Um, I mean, what I find interesting is I would have assumed that they are doing business with companies or governments in either or both of those countries already because to be honest there are, i have seen so many chain analysis chain analysis blockchain surveillance companies that already do that that if chain analysis isn't doing that they're basically not competitive in their industry i mean look at neutrino they are they, they are or were made up of people who who did business deals with governments in those countries on a regular basis. And even after they got caught doing it, they still kept doing it afterward, thinking they might be able to get away with it as their business was failing. Um, so if, if chain analysis isn't doing business with them, it's like, well, they're going to be able to find someone else who can and 
like it would really surprise me if they weren't but you know good on them for having just a little bit of moral conscience that they wouldn't work with two countries that are high up on the you know human rights abuse list um that's you know that must have been a really hard one to turn down it's interesting seeing these two stories one night after another where it is like the two sides of the equation of privacy and for sure these guys have been marketing themselves to government agencies looking for people trying to evade taxes or trying to you know get in on dark net market trying to track people down that way or you know they're trying to track down uh you know who's using you know independent ways of moving value around in these government dictatorships it's something that we have covered before and like uh we've seen these pitched to uh different you know dictators around the world and they're all developing on these at some level i mean you know from maduro to whoever's left in iran after that terrible corona outbreak there and you know just uh everybody's got their eye on this on some level and there's definitely like a market for it and like uh i'm sure yeah that uh chain analysis is always sort of yeah they're just like pivoting i think because like it's like the market is pivoting right now in the world of privacy see we well, just got a, a a letter back from the compliance department they they okayed the the deal with stalin but they they they, they nixed the the one with that hitler guy they, they said it's too risky there, there's something funny about that guy we're willing to work with one of the gulags uh, within Soviet Russia, but working with Stalin is a bit much. Yeah, I, that's <laughs> one of one of the other interesting things uh, that he also said was that because um, Peter asked him, like, you know, as a if you're if you're a cryptocurrency Bitcoin or cryptocurrency business in the United States, like, do you basically have to use something like chain analysis or are you like, can you do it yourself? Um, and if you do it yourself, is that enough for the compliance, you know, expectations? And he basically said, no, he said, if, if you're not use some, using something like chain analysis, um, you're not, com you're probably not compliant with the standards in most countries at the same time he was saying that that chain analysis has done bitcoin a favor he think he considered he said he considers himself a bitcoiner oh and he God. says that chain analysis has done he they do the bitcoin space a service by um making it easier for bitcoin businesses to integrate with the traditional financial system and give more people access to this technology, which I find astounding because the, literally the whole point that Bitcoin was created is because the existing financial system doesn't give people that access. And so if you are trying to put in standards that gatekeep businesses who don't basically morph into those same financial institutions but with crypto on top woohoo um you basically just have the same system before but with more buzzwords like i don't know how you can claim that you know we do such a great job at being a gatekeeper and also this gives people more access to this stuff like that doesn't compute yeah, I wonder if he understands that he is like, uh, he's like one of the antithesis that helps. In, like, I mean, it is one of those where it's like, uh, you need your, like, uh, whoever you're fighting against. And like, we are fighting against the right to invade people's privacy. And they think that that's like their, you know, that's not only, that's their mission is to know what you've been doing and to, and to sell that to people. And so it's like, whatever he, developments he's making, like we are iterating around that. That's where it's like these two stories from pay to endpoint to chain analysis. And it's just, uh, it's, it's, I don't know. It's almost poetic. Da -da -da. All right. You want to go into some crazy economic poetry? That's going to make you wonder what in the hell you just went through. <laughs> I lock so, up a coin. Uh, no, I can't. I can't make a haiku out of my ass. All right, what's going on with the stable coin? Well, yeah, the the issuer of the stable coin, so MakerDAO, 
the guys that issue die, they are under a lawsuit. A class action lawsuit has been filed against the Maker Foundation on behalf of investors who lost funds following a protocol failure on March 12th, or Black Thursday as it's being called now. You guys remember that big sell-off. So the suit alleges the Maker Foundation and associated parties, including the Maker Ecosystem Growth Foundation, the Die Foundation, and the Maker Foundation, quote, intentionally misrepresented the risk associated with CDP ownership, close quote, which is, uh, CDP is that, oh, geez, I forgot the acronym right now. I'll remember it by the end of this notes. Resulting in the loss of, the, this, uh, this intentional misrepresentation resulted in the loss of 8.325 million in investors' money on Black Thursday. Three counts include these. Uh, these lawsuit is three counts, including negligence, intentional misrepresentation, and negligent misrepresentation. And uh, the lawyer Johnson claims auctioned collateral was advertised to be returned to users after a 13% haircut. Instead, many positions were fully or nearly fully liquidated. The suit also specifies. Site, uh, specifically cites Maker's recent education efforts with cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase to extract CDP hold to attract CDP holders. Quote, the Maker Foundation and other third-party user interfaces informed users that because their CDPs would be significantly over collateralized, liquidation events would only result in a 13% liquidation penalty applied against the remaining collateral after which the remaining collateral would be returned to the user, close quote. What make, what's, you know, that's a, right now all these guys just got liquidated, but they were expected just a 13% haircut. It's the long and short. So what's MakerDAO doing about all this and the lawsuits? Well, they're doing some governance polls with their token infrastructure, of course. Well, they have their uh, vault compensation poll that was posted on April 6th, and they have a review of the situation that says, quote, from March 12th through 19th, ETH and BAT suffered a quick drop. This created enormous network traffic. During some spans of time, Maker, Price, Oracle failed to update due to unexpectedly high gas prices. Keepers bidding on auctions also had trouble with gas prices and with a lack of die with a lack of die liquidity. Many auctions settled with ETH valued at zero die or at far less than the market price. Most of these losses were absorbed by the Maker protocol and have been re recapitalized via flop auctions. However, vault owners have vault owners also suffered some losses. And so they have an argument for compensation where they say that the protocol did perform in a suboptimal manner. Uses users, <laughs> i.e. the vault holders or the CDP holders, were injured. It is in the interest of maker holders to try and make their users happy. The purpose of the maker token is to ensure against precisely this kind of failure. No compensation may represent a distortion of symmetry and reciprocatory, <laughs> reciprocatory i.e. the impression that we are marketing the product and receiving the reward for growth on the platform, but leaving ecosystem development risk entirely to the user. This could negatively impact reputation and future mass adoption. And lastly, we should compensate the users to avoid bad press and acrimonious gestures. So the arguments against compensation, like, you know, like what, you know, they, these, these people, they knew about these CDPs when they bought them, right? They, 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 we shouldn't compensate, so they need arguments against this compensation in this poll. So they have... Vault users are expected to understand the Ethereum ecosystem and accept liabilities associated with using that system. All contract code is open sourced and available to be audited. As such, by using the protocol, it is understood that the users are adequately informed and accept the risk of their actions. The keeper bot is the keeper bot code is open sourced. Users could have run a keeper to liquidate their own vault as a favorable as a favorable rate at a favorable rate. By compensating vault users now, the community sets a precedent where it will compensate vault users in the future. This could undermine the game theoretical mechanisms underpinning the protocol, which under that the protocol, the MakerDAO and the DAI and this whole system is confused the hell out of you so that they can hold on to your money. So in a situation like this where everybody got dumped on, 
guess who had the bags? They got your money. And uh, they're deciding whether or not to give it back to you. And meanwhile, there's a lawsuit going on against them. And we'll see whether or not their token vote infrastructure actually rewards these uh, investors before they end up in a prison cell. Well, you see the carburetor casing snapped, which turned off the, the pump piston. And you see without the pump piston running, the world battery wasn't charging. And so when the charge on that dropped off, the gas meter broke. And that's why all your money's gone. Sounds like a game of mousetrap to me. <laughs> and like, DeFi, decentralized finance, class action lawsuit. You took my money. <laughs> These things do not, if they're not compatible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is where, I mean, we've talked about investors, like a lot of this these other networks and what they're building out is rebuilding this a lot of the same crap we see and uh not solving any problems and a lot of investors are going to have to learn the hard way to uh about what this is all about and i think like uh yeah that's what's happening here and some people are not so happy about that and uh we'll see what happens i mean now it's in the it's in the courts d5 bringing financial services to the world without them don't worry if things don't work right you can sue somebody <laughs> yeah and like since you can sue somebody and there's a central issuer like let's just dun, 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 go right to the next story because this kind of falls into the same vein there was a uh a shout out on twitter to where like some of these Ethereum guys like really tried to reach out to us. Uh, let me pull this tweet up real quick. Where's it at? Sorry for. Okay, Wasting so our Ryan, time. yeah, Ryan Sean Adams RSA .eth. He's one of these .eth guys. He says, "Quote: The final boss has emerged. Central bankers want to ban stable coins, not just Tether, Dai too. They're a threat to the stability of the financial system." Translation, they want to roll their own digital currency so they can control you and stay in power. Fuck that. And then he goes into like uh, how Bitcoiners and Ethereans need to get together in order to stand up to the scourge of central banking. What do you think you're recreating with that whole story I just talked about, Ryan? Like, you think that the, the investors in the DeFi system are a lot more secure with the ecosystem that you're building? Well... You know, they're not so happy they're suing you because there is an entity to sue. And the Financial Stability Board, the FSB, released a document addressing the regulatory, supervisory, and oversight challenges raised by global stablecoins. The FSB makes 10 high-level recommendations addressed to central banks and G20 authorities at the jurisdictional level. More specifically, they recommend a unified global approach to the supervision and regulation of fiat-pegged cryptocurrencies. Furthermore. The FSB suggests to authorities that if they can't control and regulate fully decentralized stablecoins, they should consider banning them. And so, yeah, this is something that we talked about for a long time where we said, like, you know, Tether is something that's uh, it works. It's just compromise. And uh, it's a thing that was used in the meantime. And fortunately, now we have things like Liquid and the Lightning Network and we have pay to endpoint and coin joins and development has really moved a long way. And some of these over leveraged exchanges and some of this stuff like, uh, you know, it's kind of dinosaurs anyway. And now, you know, yeah, this is just another bullet in the chamber towards, you know, Ethereum, DAI, stablecoin. I mean, stablecoins is something that we've talked about a couple of times as far as regulatory authorities coming at that as the angle of how are they going to enforce negative interest rates like the imf released that paper a long while back saying like in order to actually influence negative interest rates they would have to force people co corral people into these digital currencies and like uh and make it more expensive to put your money in banks while forcing people to use this and controlling the price it's it's everything, and uh, it's one of these where we knew it was going to come under attack at one day, and this is why we Bitcoin. This is why we're in Bitcoin. So, Ryan, I'm sorry. You, you know, you and Maker and all of your investors, we still got some real hardcore lessons to learn just about reality. Yeah, but it's like that could still cause some major problems. Like things like Tether are incredibly important to this market functioning globally. 
like if, if they just start uh, coming down on anything that they don't have control or influence over, I mean, that could have serious market consequences. Yeah, I agree. Like, uh, for sure. And this is where we've been covering the Tether story for a long time. They've been trying to put Tether down for a long time. And Tether manages to keep moving around and get and still manages to stay a, a, alive. I mean, it's doing things that it can to, you know, try and further move away from move further into like a more decentralized or more accountable system with federators and doing the liquid thing. I mean, it's a uh, it's something that's necessary and it is like it serves a bridge, but. I think there's a lot of other options out there and enough market forces and market power and market momentum to keep, uh, you know, some of those alive that are necessary. I did it again. Wrong button. Um, yeah, but it's like this, you know, that's a tough thing because if they go after all of them, they're going after all of them unless they bend over. And the whole thing that really makes this useful is that the the people operating these don't bend over i mean like most of the the flows that tether is really involved in are places where you can't really get access to the dollar like tether is huge in the asian market or you know exchanges that just can't get stable banking relationships use tether as an alternative like and the reason they can do that is because tether isn't just bending over and doing whatever governments want if if they really go for those you know projects in this space that's going to be a big problem yeah and i mean like you know that's something we've talked about in the past tether is not impervious to this i mean in like maker is getting I mean, this is where we covered Maker and their lawsuit right now because they're an entity. And if the regulators really, like right now, the investors are coming at them. If the regulators want to shut down Die, it's done. They've already been trying to shoot down Tether. Now, can they do it? They possibly could. Mm -hmm. But it's, I don't know, we'll see how it goes, man. You know, this is, it's a double-edged sword especially when you get into the territory of a government making a stable coin because you're opening the door to undermining how your own financial system works when you do that like it's it's going it's going to be interesting for sure it has been yeah it's just yeah i'm getting excited about it because it's just like we've talked about this on this show for a long time about how these new instruments are going to redefine jurisdictions and state lines and you know and like in this world of covid and regulatory red tape and you know markets going crazy like it is happening man it's it's crazy to be on right here and covering this and if you guys are listening and paying attention it's an amazing world we live in isn't it mm -hmm. speaking of an amazing world we live in like why don't you tell us some more cool tech developments going on Alrighty, so uh, Brian Bishop, otherwise known as Konzur, um, dropped a prototype implementation for a vault, and um, it's it's pretty much an old concept in Bitcoin based around a covenant, which is pretty much a, a script or a a low level feature that would allow you to have an address that you could spend from but then kind of double spend and put it back into cold storage before that money is actually completely clear from the uh the script spending it out of the vault and the idea is kind of like an anti-theft feature you know like if somebody compromised your keys and moves your coins like you have a period to respond and move that to an air-gapped wallet before it's actually you know, clear and in, in, in the uh, the open. So originally, the the concept was more centered around upgrading Bitcoin so that you could just have UTXO scripts that would let you do this. Um, this is is more of a uh, honestly, it's kind of like a reactive system, like the Lightning Network, 
and it uses pre-signed transactions. So pretty much the idea is you would make a whole tree of pre-signed transactions and it would fragment the coins coming out of the vault into different UTXOs with different time locks. So like you you pull money out of the vault with the first pre-signed transaction and that makes three UTXOs. One that you can spend immediately, one that say you have a time lock of a week on, the next one two weeks, and you can build a whole chain of transactions that subdivides like that. And the idea is you make this this chain of transactions and then sign them and then delete all the uh, the private keys for all of those transactions. And now the idea is if somebody compromises the, the main key in your vault and spends that to, to unlock the, the first UTXO that you can spend right away, um, you submit the pre-signed transactions to kind of shove that into cold storage. So it would be like a fan out where like these UTXOs, these three ones are made, two of them are time locked and can go right back into cold storage and then one of them is free to spend wherever right now but you also have a pre-signed transaction to send that into cold storage and the idea is you kind of have these waiting periods before you can actually move the coins where you can use these pre-signed transactions to take the coins back if somebody compromised your keys and send them to a separate wallet that you have completely air gapped that hopefully wasn't compromised. And so it would also require kind of something like a watchtower. You, you would have to have some software that would watch the chain constantly. And if it sees the coins move out of your vault, alert you so you can decide whether to move things into cold storage or not, or, you know, just automatically do that depending on certain circumstances. And so it, the, the idea is to kind of have like a, a hot wallet that has an enforced uh, rate limiting as far as how quickly and how much coin you can take out of it and the recovery mechanism to just shove everything into cold storage if somebody compromised those hot keys and tried to steal the coins. And so it's it's a lot more limited than the the original ideas kind of looking at changes to Bitcoin script. But I still think this could be a very, you know, useful construct. Like, you know, I ha I have a, a cold storage set up and I just pull stuff out of that every once in a while. I don't really have to interact with it much. But let's say you're somebody who does have to interact with your cold storage constantly. This kind of setup would allow you to just have a hot wallet set up with all the coins there or however many coins you want to have into or in it and have that extra security layer, that limitation for how fast you can actually access that and spend it wherever you want with the, the safety feature to just put it all into cold storage if something goes wrong. And so I think it's, it's a very useful thing for people who have to interact and, and are using their coins constantly, but you know don't want to have to constantly interact with their actual cold storage. They, they want to have some kind of middle ground set up. And so I think, I think this could wind up be, being very useful for businesses, for any kind of individual who has to manage large amounts of Bitcoin regularly transacting with it. Like it's, it's a very flexible thing. And uh, most importantly, um, this is a prototype. Do not use with real money. Uh, Brian is planning on actually building out like a whole test framework for this and actually running it through a lot more um, testing in different edge cases before this gets anywhere near the point of playing with it on mainnet. But, you know, we can do this right now. It doesn't require any consensus changes or script upgrades. So I think this is uh, another cool toy to play with.
Heck yeah, it was really cool. And, uh, you know, it's like just looking, you know, as you're covering the story, it's like, uh, you know, this Brian Bishop, he's the CTO of Avanti Bank, that uh, that bank that Caitlin Long's doing in Wyoming. So I imagine like this has got uh, some sort of R&D tied into what he's doing there and, you know, what they're building out there. And yeah, this is just uh, really impressive stuff to just sort of see like all these developments happen where there's no real you know consensus layer changes necessary and uh we're finding some real solutions it's really great what you can achieve when people really start to focus on okay let's let's build with the tools we have mm-hmm. all righty so are we ready for a mixed bag of news and shinobi ranting <laughs> what we usually have we <laughs> <laughs> go for it so trezor uh recently released a firmware update i think three days ago um and yeah um the first thing i have to say is kind of shady how they did it um they have two separate blog posts um one which has the new features covered in in the update and only the new features and one that has the new features as well as some security issues that were fixed and they blasted both of these out on both days and it was really kind of confusing trying to sort through everything and i really think at this point that that was intentionally done to try to have something circulating with just the positives of this and and downplaying the negatives which is incredibly disingenuous but pretty much all of the the bugs uh for the most part were change handling issues so op returns uh were treated as a a change output um this i mean I'll, i'll cut them some slack this really couldn't have done anything to lose people money um but it did cause issues or would have with any kind of top layer protocol like Omni, uh, which Tether is built on, or um, Counterparty, those kinds of things that use op return. Um, so they've added some stricter validation of op return outputs. Um, there was a another issue where you could pull um, some one of two multi-sig attacks. Um, The first issue was with very large transactions. Um, There's actually a two phase um, protocol going on where you check the inputs for correctness one time um, in the first phase, and then again in the second time, but there was no cross check to make sure that they match. So you could insert um, a change output with a one of two multi-sig, which the attacker could then unilaterally spend. that was fixed by adding some more cross-checking in both phases of that between the inputs to make sure that they actually properly add up. Um, as well, there was an issue um, with the field size checking using the, the protobuf um, protocol that they use to communicate between the Trezor and the host device. Um, you could pretty much send a previous hash uh, input that was way longer than the exact 32 bytes that it should be and hide a malicious output in that that could be parsed and pretty much trick the uh, the device into signing a change output again that would uh, allow an attacker to steal coins through a one of two. Um, so those were all fixed in this. Um, And I find it kind of ridiculously absurd that they had multiple issues with that, given that literally six months ago or so, they had that exact issue with a vulnerability. So it really boggles my mind that they did not thoroughly dive through that entire aspect of of change and input and output handling when this happened the first time. Now, that said, there's also some new features in here. Um, again, still kind of a mixed bag. So they are introducing a session caching feature 
so that people can just switch between different passphrase wallets um, on the device in a single session without having to constantly uh, re-enter things. So that sounds cool until you dig around and look at how this is interacting with the HWI interface that Andrew Chow has been working on so that uh, hardware wallets can work with Bitcoin Core and a few other projects have actually been using. Um, so pretty much this feature requires actually tracking session IDs for the device to switch between them. And it requires tracking state for that. Um, so at first, this update just broke um, HWI and it did not work with the Trezor One or the Model T. Um, it, sh it should be functional now, but um, what this does is pretty much create the most absurd user experience in the world um, using the Model T you pretty much either have to enter the passphrase. Well, first of all, you, you have to enter the passphrase um, every time the device takes a single action. So any operation you perform, individual operation and in using the device, you have to re-enter the passphrase. And so this requires either entering the passphrase in the computer completely negating all the security of being able to do it on the touch screen or enter it in the touch screen every single time. And when Andrew Chow brought this up on GitHub, um, pretty much Pavel um, just said um, in response to the suggestion that the Trezor itself track those session IDs and information on the device so that it could just automatically provide that in interacting with software, um, pretty much told him, you know, absolutely not verbatim. This is Shinobi translation here. Um, go fuck yourself. And is now expecting every piece of software out there to that interacts with the Trezor to just work around and have to create a new database and track these session IDs to work properly. Or, HWI has to integrate a database itself and track all of that when the Trezor is plugged in. Um, and HWI is supposed to literally just be a stateless translator between different APIs. It is just a program with, with no database of its own, no state to track that just translates between the hardware wallets and software wallets. And Trezor is pretty much, just, I don't care, um, just add a database to it. So, frankly, like, they're fucking jagoffs. Um, and this is the second time recently that they did something like this. They did the same thing with the Shamir secret sharing um, standard that they made in isolation without talking to anybody else um, that actually creates problems for other devices um, because of the memory constraints of an integrated chip like that. So like, really, like, what the fuck are you, are you doing here? Are, are you trying to have a simple, easy, safe device for people to use or just build things the stupidest way possible and then just make it other people's problem? Um, because that, that's what they're doing with this. Now, all that said, they do have two features, which I think are a good thing in this. Um, first of all, they have a new wipe pin. So you can actually set a separate pin on the Trezor um, that when entered immediately erases all the private information on the device. That's really good. Um, they have also introduced a, um, I don't know, they, they call it SD card protection. I, I would call it more, more of an SD card token. But it allows you to um, secure the device and encrypt your information, um, not just with the pin, but also adding a random cryptographic token it generates to an SD card so that you have to have that SD card plugged into the device to access it and input the pin. So this is something that actually adds some kind of physical security to the device even if it's not 
by improving the device's hardware itself. Um, if you don't have that SD card, even if you can break the device itself, that SD card is necessary to decrypt the information on your Trezor. So I think this is actually really good. Um, it's finally something in terms of the security model of the Trezor that actually incorporates physical security. But I do have to get a little jab in and be like, um, that doesn't contradict the entire argument that physical security doesn't matter they've been making for years, zing. But you know that said, um, I think that's a good security improvement because it, it's doing something to take into account physical security. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, dude, thank God for those last two features because it was starting to sound like a real shit show. And, um, you know, that's where I was just like wondering, like, why the drama, man? Like, you got to remove the session IDs for hardware wallet integration. Like, there's so much development going on there. But, you know, some of this stuff is above my head. But, yeah, it's uh, it's good to see that they are still you know, iterating and creating some more, uh, some more security enabled features, like, uh, being able to wipe all your, uh, your private ID and info on there and, you know, trying to also just make sure that there's more physical security added to the device. And yeah, those are good things. Cause, uh, yeah, it's just like, what is going on on the other stuff? But you know, some of this is just, Hey, it's above my pay grade. Oh my God. I can't restrain myself. Also, dude, the white pin has only been on their to do list since 2018. Like, Oh my God. It's, it's like, I, I, I'm um, trying, I'm trying to add the positive spin at the end, dude, but it's like, dude, treasure is a joke. Like it's a joke. Yeah. Stores your keys. Yeah. But yeah. just watch those firmware updates. All right. Well, we'll take it out with the compliment. They added some kind of physical security. All right. I mean, I'm going to shut my mouth now. Still better than Coinbase. Won't argue that. Definitely better than Coinbase. All right. All right. Let's talk about somebody else is better than one of those old dinosaurs. I'm talking about the miners, though. Somebody that might be better than Bitmain. We're going to figure that out. Like, uh, Micro BT. They, uh, let's see. Well, before we get into this, let's just say, like, it's only 3,400 plus box or 23 days to, away until the happening. So there's a lot of this, like, uh, race on the next round of mining hardware and the, you know, to deliver the sufficient new hardware and the race is on. So, yeah, Micro BT, one of Bitmain's biggest competitors, is rolling out three new miners the What's Miner MS, the M30S Plus, M30S Plus Plus. And M31S Plus. They all got a plus on them. Chen Jinping, COO of MicroBT, says we are entering the quote unquote 3X era of mining, which is referring to a mining efficiency that's below the 40 watts per terahash. And uh, they're saying that they're going to deliver these miners, quote, or they're available via both warehouse inventory and pre-orders that can be delivered in up to 30 days, close quote. And these are going to compete with the Antminer S19 and S19 Pro, which are set to deliver sometime in May. And, yeah, the mining ecosystem is really ramping up before the halving. I mean, last difficulty drop, we saw a good amount of hash rate come back online and a steep recovery that's looking greater and greater, I'm sure... More miners will get wrecked, you know, as like uh, if, if, as like time goes on, and they really start to we run into some more liquidity crunches. If possible, you know, if there's a place to grind somebody out, you're gonna get grinded out in the mining ecosystem. And uh, yeah, you have to watch these claims on shipment and efficiency. Last year, Micro BT Micro BT sold over six hundred thousand units, but some were late on delivery. But uh, the system is becoming a lot more efficient with these new miners and these new uh, this new hardware as it's coming online. And uh, yeah, so Bitmain's got some competitors running in town trying to uh, you know shore up that mining hardware and just get some new uh, some new chips out there on the in the market. And yeah, uh, I guess that this is a uh, this is all just good competition for Bitmain. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, th this is going to be interesting for them because, like, looking at the the chipset efficiencies for these, they're a little under Bitmain's. 
<laughs> with like these new hardware uh, devices and actually have more hash rate um, on one of them by a thin margin. So yeah, I mean, they're, they're pretty much grinding to Bitmain's efficiency point right now. Uh, I'm betting that uh, <laughs> Jihan is not very happy that one of his former engineers left and uh, started this company. <laughs> No, sir. I'm sure he's not. Like, golly, I saw the last time I even saw him was that's all they were doing something for their whatever one of those other networks uh, was having a having or something. I mean, dude, this is like this. This could get very interesting, man, because like you know the this market is just wrecked in terms of revenue and demand. Period. But that said, like micro BT is not Bitmain. They did not make years of idiotic business decisions regarding Bcash and don't have all the, the balance sheet debt and load that a company like Bitmain does. So if they can really meet demand and hit these kinds of price points and, and efficiency points, like grind under or at least two Bitmain's point, like that could get really interesting. Like they could grind Bitmain down hardcore through this just by not having all the dead weight Bitmain does. Oh yeah. Bitmain's got so much dead weight that they're issuing coupons. I mean like uh buyers of the Ant Miner S seventeen and T seventeen, they uh the delivery was set between mid February and end of April and uh those guys are receiving coupons of seventeen to two hundred and seventy bucks because uh, you know, they sold the units at like i guess like right above 1500 before uh black thursday or whatever it was you know march 12th and the price drop and so they're trying to compensate their customers but those coupons are only redeemable back at bitmain and yeah the margins are thin mm -hmm. i mean i think they're actually doing that too but like they don't have all the the debt and the the dead weight of inventory like it's it's yeah, interesting. You know, I keep ranting whenever mining come up, comes up that I think the consumer market is dead inside the next five years. But doesn't mean we can't have some interesting uh, entertainment and shuffling going on in that five years. Oh, yeah. Lots of new hardware to come online. Boom, boom, boom. Should we move along? Yeah, let's. Uh, what's this big news, man? There's uh, like I know there's been so much going on with the Cash App, but what's up with this uh, Cash App Cash Tag Twitter craziness? Well, see, this is really interesting. Um, it looks like uh, Twitter is putting a bio field for people's cash tags and moving to kind of integrate the two of those together. And let's just say I, I, I had some thoughts going through my head and I found this thread by uh, somebody, Brett Winton, who pretty much exactly articulated them. Um, you tie together Cash App and Twitter like that. And I like it is a mark my word. It is a matter of time until you can just send Bitcoin across Cash App like you can dollars and pounds. It is a matter of time. Then Cash App and Twitter effectively become financial rails for anybody in the world. And if you can actually get a, a friendly attitude or leeway um, in terms of local jurisdictions, um, you can just offer a custodial Bitcoin account on Cash App that lets you send to other people on Cash App, and that's it. Like no, no buying or selling Bitcoin, nothing that would require KYC for the legacy system, just a custodial Bitcoin wallet. And you've just opened Bitcoin to the entire world. You have given them a simple way to interact with people, tying this into Twitter. You've given them the account on Cash App that's just to custody or send to receive Bitcoin. And you, you have just plugged people into a Bitcoin ecosystem that literally covers the entire world. Anywhere that you can download Cash App and get on Twitter. 
And I think a lot of people are not going to like that for all of the privacy reasons. Like, obviously, that is going to be a completely legacy system where the operators see everything. But on the other side of that, that is a massive potential thing to just get people into an open financial system that that would just flip the switch yeah i mean that's one of those where we've talked about how exactly is the cash app twitter integration going to happen and when's it going to be lightning enabled because we know that's coming too i mean like and these are all just sort of like ticks in the roadmap towards like a real you know bitcoin banking system and an open banking system that's like uh that that is not just uh dishing out a bunch of uh shit coins and like uh you know school programs to learn about you know these new token economy systems like one that's just really building out an infrastructure for people to store some value spend some value be it you know in bitcoin or lightning or you know through twitter and how they do that it's going to be uh yeah it's going to be something that does help scale bitcoin it's going to be another you know, one of those players where, you know, we've talked about, you know, yeah, it does kind of have some privacy implications, but it's it's one of those necessary layers. Mm-hmm. And if you really think about it, on-chain, through Lightning, both, there is absolutely no reason why anybody in an ecosystem like that could not seamlessly interact with somebody who's using Bitcoin natively. So that there is no reason why somebody who just has a cash app wallet like that couldn't pay me over the lightning network seamlessly or or I pay through lightning network and it winds up in their cash app account. It's absolutely no technical reason that could not just easily be the case. Well, no. there's there's no technical reason, but obviously there's going to be regulatory reasons that are probably going to get in the way of that. Um I don't at this point, I mean, I would have to see how it works and I would have to check how easy it is and who is able to set up a cash app account. I mean, it's mostly US based at this point, but um, I would be more interested in the implications of just, you know, whether there's Bitcoin involved or not, it's gonna be interesting to see how, you know, basically adding this financial aspect to, to social media, specifically on Twitter, and you know allowing in like making it easier for followers to pay people that they follow and you know like their content to like how that changes the you know interactions that people have and because a lot of people already do that in a way i mean they post links to their i don't know what the version for paypal is but there's a part of paypal where you can just post a link is it Venmo? I mean, Venmo is another example. They can also post links to Venmo, but there's like a PayPal thing where you kind of just click and pay. I can't remember what it's called. It's like something anyway. But people are already kind of posting those kinds of profiles and links. Um, it's just, you know, sometimes they put it in their bio, but it's not a dedicated space. But if Twitter is indicating that they want people to display that, they're kind of saying, well we want to make it easier for people to actually earn money from the content that they post if their followers like it and want to su support it which is interesting because so far most most social media sites don't do that like there there's some hacky ways to do that there's obviously gab tried to do that but that's not a mainstream one um so it's going to be interesting to see how that affects, you know, interaction on social media. Yeah, well, I just hope that my speculation about that building out and touching bases with Bitcoin is right. Because, I mean, it's like, really think about it. That would be a lot of trade-offs and a lot of people wouldn't want to use it. But that would be a massive benefit to Bitcoin and just people out there. 
I mean, the one, I mean, I do kind of see it as a benefit that both Twitter and Cash App are led by, I mean, I don't know how much similarity there is if there's more people than Jack Dorsey that are in both uh, places, but it probably, people would feel safer with, you know, having an integration with an application that's run by a company by basically the same person as Twitter. Uh, rather than them getting into a partnership and, you know, that partnership could fall out and, you know, there could be issues with that. Whereas if you basically have the same person that's running both things and has the same vision, then you're less likely to have those issues. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. And um, I think uh, another social media giant might get a little butt hurt in the coming year oh, or two. Yeah. I'm I'm quite interested with the title you chose for this story because you're implying that Libra ever had any balls to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the title of the story is Libra is castrated. And yeah, they're not going the you know, sophisticated route of Bitcoin and lightning like uh we'll just let you go through the show notes. Udi says, quote, as expected, Libra is now officially a Venmo clone at launch. No one would be able to build their own Libra wallets or hold their own keys. Only hosted wallet providers will be allowed after acquiring KYC AML related regulatory licenses and approval from Libra itself. Close quote. That leads to Libra's tweet, which says, quote, We have initiated the formal payment system licensing process with FINMA Media, with FINMA and updated our white papers to reflect key design challenges to the Libra payment system, which they have a link to there in the show notes, and it says hashtag financial inclusion and hashtag tech for good. Oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, I love it. And yeah, as just as we suspected, like this was Facebook all along, this was surveillance all, all the way down, like they weren't going to go the way that they could give somebody control of their value and allow them to hold their own private keys and, you know, try and secure someone's ability to, you know, solve problems where censorship is there. Like this is the other side of that equation that we were talking about earlier. And, um, you know, they're there that we, we've talked about this in the last time, uh, one of the, uh, geez, I'm trying to remember the story because we've talked about Libra so many times, but recently, uh, they were in the stimulus. They were they were talked about in the stimulus package as possibly being approved, and uh, they didn't get in there. And uh, they were saying that they were going to keep fighting for it, and they were going to keep working towards regulatory approval. It looks like they've continued to do that, and they've uh, they've adjusted their white papers accordingly, and now they are good to go to be the social media vin. So we want to start our own blockchain like currency with its own uh, basket of assets, okay? No, we don't like currencies. Okay, what what if we just what if we just do a blockchain U.S. dollar? We don't like blockchains. What if we just clone PayPal? Okay. Hello, surveillance capitalism cattle fodder. We have gone back and reviewed our white paper and determined that decentralization is no longer uh, in accordance with our compliance uh, responsibilities. <laughs> Hashtag tech for good. Oh, I love it. I just think it's hilarious that anybody ever thought that a company like that would be allowed by governments to make their own cryptocurrency. Like, you're out of your mind. <laughs> so like that's exactly why cash app square twitter are building all of their shit on bitcoin so they just don't even have to worry about that like that's it's not a target on them and like just the the mountain of the the sugar mountain of stupid that fucking mark zuckerberg lives on is amazing that he even tried to go that route that guy thought he was going to be president. Then he's like, I'm going to hire a president. And now he's like, I mean, this guy, you know, he's he's one of those Silicon Valley crazies. I mean, these guys think they control the world. Sugar Mountain, Mark. Sugar Mountain. You can't be 20 <laughs> on Sugar Mountain.
All right. Well, that about covers the uh, the tech startups. But uh, I guess there was like a Bitcoin startup recently that I was shocked to see like uh, fall by the wayside. But I guess not too shocked compared, I guess, with what all is going on. Janine, were you going to tell us about this? Yeah. So um, purse.io announced uh, on April 16th, which I think was, I can't remember what day it is, but I think it was two or three days ago. Um that uh, they would be dissolving their company. And if you're not familiar with what Purse.io is, they're a San Francisco-based company that's been running a service for several years that allowed you to basically buy things on Amazon with Bitcoin and at a discount. Um, so on Twitter, they stated, we've made the very difficult decision to dissolve the company. We're grateful for the opportunity afforded by our supporters to build products and services for the cryptocurrency community. We will continue to offer support for ongoing orders and withdrawals until June 26, 2020. Kitty, you're not supposed to attack the mic. No, actually, that was not the kitty's fault. That is because my mic is standing on an empty uh, food container, and so it's unstable, much like the uh, stable coins. Um, <laughs> anyway, to... <laughs> to <laughs> that joke came out better than I thought anyway uh it's been a privilege serving people all around the world we're thankful to, uh for our customers who use purse uh increasing bitcoin's utility and distribution we're also thankful to all the developers and companies who continue to support open source projects including bitcoin and handshake uh thank you for helping us make crypto useful end quote um so yeah this one I mean, I I don't know them well enough to say that I'm necessarily surprised that they're dissolving the company, but I am surprised at the timing because, like, literally a few episodes ago, we were talking about, you know, what are people with Bitcoin or without Bitcoin going to do in relation to Bitcoin? Are they going to sell Bitcoin? Are they going to spend it on supplies? Or are they going to hold it? And so you'd think, you know, with all of the people who need to get things ordered you know remotely can't go into stores around the world all of the you know extra load that's been on amazon the you know i don't know if they have new customers or just people are using them a lot more than they usually do but you'd think that this would be a time where they would be popular because if people need a way to spend their bitcoin to get supplies that they need during the lockdowns around the world they would have been using purse i assumed i mean they're not that obscure of a company they've been around for a while um i'm sure they would have been able to find them but if you know that was something they wanted to do so i'm kind of surprised at the timing um but i guess either that is not the case and people haven't been using them they haven't been wanting to spend their Bitcoin or maybe just something with Purse's financial situation got affected by all of this or, you know, who knows. But I am, I am, that's all I will say. I'm surprised at the timing of this. It seems a bit weird. You know, I actually kind of have a theory about this because like the, their whole business model is just a marketplace matching people with Amazon credit or gift cards to bitcoiners so that you know people can buy the bitcoin bitcoiners can buy the shit but they they fulfill themselves anything with a five percent um discount like the the low the the lowest discount you can do and i kind of always assumed that like they were involved in that and had some kind of arrangement through an affiliate program with Amazon. Like you, you, you can get a kickback <clears throat> for directing traffic there. Um, and that's how they actually made that profitable because otherwise, you know what I mean? You're just pretty much dealing with a huge fraud rate and a massive risk. And where's your profit margin coming from? And Amazon just slashed the shit out of all their affiliate payouts for the affiliate programs i think like a week ago or something oh that, and so that makes I th- more sense mm-hmm. i i think that's probably what happened here because otherwise i i can't really think like about a rational explanation for that uh, 
I'm with you guys. I'm also just just thinking like it's maybe something to do with just Amazon's ability to actually fulfill orders right now. Like, uh, you know, there is that like there's, you know, a lot of this like, hey, your order's placed and it's on the way. It's shipped. It's shipping. Turns out it never got there. Aye. And Bitcoin is already there. <laughs> like, you know. Affiliate marketing is a well that easily runs dry. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess, yeah, it's sad to see them go. I mean, because I did see a lot of people use that service. I mean, it was one of those services where I did see people using it. But, you know, this is some hard times. Let me put it this way. I think the service was useful, but like the political shit that the company did in this space is like, you guys are morons. Like they, they, yeah. they, they have attacked Bitcoin for all intents and purposes multiple times. Okay, well, yeah, I'm not going to go down that road. I've just know I've, I've known some Bitcoiners that said, yeah, I bought something off purse before. So, all right, Alrighty. you want to take us into what's the developments with uh, this character that's just like going to be around for maybe just a little bit while longer, hopefully. and then I'll see you in court. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I'm actually surprised that no one's given him a uh, Game, of, Game of Thrones-esque uh, title yet. I'm sure it'd be something like Father of Fraud, Breaker of Sanity, and all kinds of things like that. Um, but yeah, so, surprise, uh, Craig Wright is still involved in a ton of lawsuits. Um, and this is obviously not a great time to have outgoing lawsuits, uh, or ongoing lawsuits. Uh and that has uh, clearly um, not gone in a good direction for him. Uh, basically, all of the major lawsuits that we know of with you know major personalities in the Bitcoin or cryptocurrency space are uh, either canceled or just not going well for him uh, in terms of uh, Vitalik. So this was all published in Decrypt. Uh, they got comments from a lot of these people. Uh, uh, they summarize a uh, right targeted booter and over a GitHub repository he had been maintaining entitled Cult of Craig. Uh, the repository was a collection of links to articles that booter and claimed were evidence that he is not Satoshi, including quotes from experts. Experts is for some reason in quotes, calling Wright a fraud. Eventually, Wright filed a lawsuit, but it didn't go very far. Uh, in our, in my our case, as far as I can remember, they just didn't follow up on the lawsuit, and eventually the deadline ran out. Buterin told Decrypt. Uh, in terms of Adam Back, uh, Wright sent back a letter on April 16, 2019, asking him to retract his claims about Wright and the is and issue a public apology. The letter stated he need to re needed to respond by April 23rd. Back ignored it. And indeed, Craig Wright followed it up. He filed a lawsuit in June, providing documents in July, only it was short-lived. Several weeks after he announced his intent to sue, he dropped the suit. Wright also paid back uh, $6,666,000, wait, 6,000, six, 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 there's four sixes, uh, pounds, and uh, the equivalent of $8,400 for his legal costs. Um, Roger Ver. The lawsuit referred to a recent video where Ver had called Wright a fraud and a liar. Uh, surprised, honestly, why we haven't gotten one of these yet, because I'm pretty sure we've said that a lot. Uh, it asked for an apology and damages, but the lawsuit didn't stick. It was thrown out on a technicality. Uh, Ver has lived in Japan for 14 years and is not a UK citizen. Wright was told to pay Ver £60,000, or $73,000 in legal costs, but is, a currently, is currently appealing the decision. Um, by the way, good for Ver, because it would be a shame, you know, uh, he probably must have gotten bankrupted by, uh, all of those 1,000 Bitcoin, uh, fee transactions that he claims to have sent, so, uh, wouldn't want to bankrupt him through legal trouble instead. Um, in terms of Hodlnots, uh, after Hodlnot called Wright a scammer and a fraud, Craig, uh, Wright threatened him with a lawsuit, but Hodlnot beat him to the punch, and the libel case in the UK was thrown out due to a lack of jurisdiction, which Wright is again appealing. And then in the last case of Peter McCormick, uh, Wright has managed to get one lawsuit going in the UK, largely because Peter McCormick, host of what, uh, the What Bitcoin Did podcast actually resides in the UK. That's a huge help, especially when everyone is under lockdown. 
uh, writes uh, suing for 100,000 pounds or $126,000 over McCormick calling him a fraud. Um, McCormick recently posted an update on Twitter. He said a procedural judge wanted to see Wright prove that he is Satoshi. One second, I have to scroll. And uh, McCormick said that he offered um, Craig Wright 250,000 pounds or $315,000 if Wright could sign a Bitcoin transaction using one of Satoshi's private keys. Only Craig Wright claims that they're locked in a bonded trust uh, that he can't access, which we've gone over a number of times because that's also a point of contention in another lawsuit in Florida, good old Florida. So yeah, Craig Wright not having a good time right now. Wrecked! Wright is getting wrecked, no way. Oh goodness, this is good to see. So when's he finally going to, you know, um, get hit with a perjury charge or contempt? Or, you know, when, when something actually going to happen? Gosh, I hope he just disappears. Well, not the, that way, like, gosh, you know, because people are going to take that the wrong way. Just meaning, like, he leaves the space alone, like, stops, like, saying he's Satoshi and everything. I doubt that's going to happen. And I'm sure some people took that the wrong way. Like, I don't mean it that way. Yeah. Well, old drama is boring. What new drama might we get? New drama, new drama, new drama. Oh, man. Are you kidding me? Some more above my pay grade drama here where I saw this and I was like, well, I know that this is some big names and some big stuff happening, but I don't know really what it's all about. We can maybe talk about it. So it looks like uh, this person at BHEC Beck 39 uh, on Twitter, he uh, tagged at Cobra, and uh, he says, I'm out of the loop, uh, what up? And it says, and it shows a screenshot of a uh, merged commit from Cobra Bitcoin, who uh, removed Thamos as one of the uh, co-owners of the domain Bitcoin.org. And then whenever you start to flip down and you can read like a uh, statement from Thamos about the whole subject matter on uh, Bitcoin Talk, he says, quote, so this is Thamos, quote, Satoshi created both Bitcoin.org and this forum, which was originally at Bitcoin.org slash SMF dot later. The forum got its own domain name, but due to this history, Bitcoin.org and Bitcoin.talk have traditionally been linked. And for quite some time, Cobra and I have together managed the domain names. However, Cobra has never had much involvement in Bitcoin.org's operation. And I haven't involved myself in Bitcoin.org. I'm sorry, let me re repeat that. Cobra has never had much involvement in BitcoinTalk.org's operation. And I haven't involved myself in Bitcoin.org for a couple of years. So the linkage between the two no longer really made any sense. Therefore, we decided to separate the domains. I no longer have any access to the Bitcoin.org domain name and Cobra no longer has any access to the BitcoinTalk.org domain name. The two sites should be viewed as totally separate, which in practice they have been for years. There will be no changes whatsoever on BitcoinTalk.org due to this, and I'd assume that the same will be true for Bitcoin.org. The Bitcoin.org open source project has been advancing steadily, and I hope and expect that it will continue to do so thanks to the efforts of its contributors. Thanks to Cobra for handling much of BitcoinTalk.org's domain name related work in the past. Close quote. And yeah, Cobra Bitcoin, Thamos have been around for a long time, ever since I came in for sure. And yeah, there was a lot of talk about uh, censorship or, you know, who's got narratives and domains. And I mean, as somebody that's just looking at this from my standpoint, it's like, well, maybe I'll go back to BitcoinTalk.org and you know, start reading the forums and maybe participate in there. Just my own sort of like, well, what do I think of this? Well, honestly, I don't know. I think either nothing is going to change or uh, Cobra will just start getting petty about stupid shit like what wallets he lists or doesn't list it on the site and shit like that. I mean, what is there really to do? Like, you think after all this time, he's going to try and flip the site over to Bcash or something? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, 
that's where I, I don't know Cobra Bitcoin kind of lost me with that whole fork and um I know that he's kind of taken more of a neutral stance recently. But, How much is Blockstream uh, paying you? <laughs> How much is Blockstream nothing. paying you? Zero, Cobra. You, Zero. You, you remember that when he had a psychotic episode and just started DMing yeah. everybody on Twitter asking them how much Blockstream was paying them? Yeah, there's been a lot of that where it's just, uh, it doesn't seem like good for like a solid foundation for development or, you know, just like a good place to talk and, I mean, get things done. I mean, like, whatever. You know, this is where it, I said, this is website. all above my pay grade. It's a website. If he decides to be a retard with it, whatever. I mean, there was never anything anyone could do anyway. It's <laughs> like it, it is what the situation was. Yeah. I mean, those two guys always were separate. It's, uh, you know, now it's just official. All right. So what else is going on in this uh, Sphinx? What? Why are you asking me about Egyptian structures what something about a sphinx i don't you know i don't know you know it's just like i was saying there's so much going on it's hard to keep up with the, what else going on in the story well, and this one i was like i just don't know hold on a second because my computer is being retarded there we go um so yeah uh pretty much there is a uh beta version of uh sphinx chat out right now um that some people are playing around with um the kind of encrypted messaging app that uses the actual lightning network, which I have said a few times, I think is kind of silly. Um, but yeah, um, you can do real time end to end encrypted chat, um, video chat through Jitsi. Um, obviously send and uh, receive payments over the lightning network. And, um, you can send images that are paywalled. Um, no clue how they are paywalled, but I'm betting that they're tying um, a decryption key for an image to the uh, the pre-image release of a invoice somehow. But yeah, I mean, I think that this is kind of a silly use of Lightning Network and won't make scalable sense in the long term. But I am sure that half of the people in this space will be talking on this app when it releases. Okay, yeah, this is pretty cool. I'm gonna have to, yeah, see if I can get in on this because, um, you know, yeah, Sphinx messaging. My sats are for saving, not for bullshitting. <laughs> yeah, I like to think that too. But some of these developments, you gotta like, uh, you know, you gotta spend the money to to, uh, to earn the developments. Alrighty, and All right, so yeah. what are we gonna chastise Unless. a business for? Well, you know, I mean, like, yeah, you know, there's all these developments, and we talk about all this tech and everything, and like, man, all these big names in the space and all this. It's like, Bitmex is a big name, and they are not reusing addresses anymore. What? They're like, you know, they've been reusing addresses. That's like been the best practice for like, if you're over there and you're just reusing the same address, not so anymore, or maybe you are. I don't know. Hold up. So Bitmex put out a post that says, quote, Today, we are happy to announce a new feature rolling out to BitMEX users. Addresses! As part of an ongoing effort to improve tools and options, we are introducing a feature that enables users to input and save wallet addresses for quick retrieval during withdrawals. Yay! It sounds like they're going to stop reusing addresses across the network, right? It's going to be good, right? Well, no. Hold up. Yeah. I uh, did some searching across Twitter, and I ran across uh, Francis from Bull Bitcoin. He says, quote, I deleted my post being happy about BitMEX having stopped address reuse because I mistakenly thought they had improved their privacy by having multiple deposit addresses. But turns out it was just an address book in their dashboard. Thumbs down, close quote. And I have to agree with that. That's a big thumbs down. Like, BitMEX, what are you doing with this announcement? Come on, either build real address reuses or not. Like, try to, you know, I mean, do something. This is where it's just like, okay, you're you're putting in this new dashboard feature of address to where, you know, people can have, I guess, quicker withdrawals to these addresses that they uh, they tie up in their dashboard, but it's not real addresses on the network. Like, come on, BitMEX, this is a little, uh, what was this? 
Fix your shit. All right. And with that, I think we did cover all the stories. Done enough. Final thoughts. All right. I'm going to just... I'm going to just jump into this final thought I've been thinking about like this whole past week, like, cause, uh, you know, this pay to endpoint stuff and like, uh, you know, making coin joins more friendly on the network and improving privacy was just like so uplifting because, uh, you know, here locally, uh, they've talked about, and I've seen this more across the board on like uh, phase two initiatives for COVID, uh, breaking, you know, opening back up the economy. A lot of that includes, Apple and Google's contact tracing and uh, trying to uh, move forward the scale of that. And um, I just want to reiterate that we should be pushing back against that um, as much as possible. I know that uh, some of this stuff seems fruitless and it's really hard to stand up for privacy in the, in the world. You know, not many people understand or care, but uh, this is big. And like, it's one of those things where I've talked about... Um, I've just been thinking about and reflecting on. It's like, what ha what is what is ch this world changing into from this situation? Uh, you know, I've been through big situations in the past and seen the world change. And, you know, I've put on a uniform and, like, tried to see what it took to, to implement these rights in this country. And to see this uh, all kind of go through is really, uh, it's really upsetting to me, to the court. But, um, you know, I've kind of turned a corner on it in, uh, in knowing that, like, what we're building here with Bitcoin and, like, uh, we can build, we can really implement some sound freedoms for people that they've never had before. And uh, it's one of those things where uh, it's a big, big fight. And uh, I, just, I just hope everybody's still, like, uh, paying attention to this contact tracing and uh, trying to fight it where they can. I will not get the chip. Okay, well then, I'll go. Um, I don't think, uh, as far as I remember, I don't think we really said anything about uh, the fact that Tulsi and Bernie Sanders have uh, dropped out of the race now. Um, Tulsi was particularly disappointing because, uh, you know, she was supposed to be the... She was the most uh what word should i use she was probably one of the best options for a third party candidate that was running in the u.s not to say that i you know agree with voting or anything like that that hasn't changed but it, i was interested to see whether she would get anywhere um and I'm not particularly disappointed that she dropped out. I'm disappointed that, once again, um, as much as people like to talk about how they have principles and how they're different and they're not like that other guy who's corrupt and, you know, made your lives miserable and will continue to make your lives miserable, um, as much as they like to say that, um, both Tulsi and Bernie Sanders, after uh, dropping out of the race, uh, decided to endorse Joe Biden, and we're now at the point where it's basically going to be no. an election, unless something really changes, which, you know, who knows, it could happen, but basically, in the US, you're looking at a race between Joe Biden and Trump, which, if you ask me, is not a race at all. Uh, it's basically right. two sides of the same coin. Yes, there is a cat I in the background. I think the cat's in the, <laughs> my name, in the race. My name the is cat. Joe Biden, and I'm running for mayor of the moon. Yes. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and there was a really excellent criticism that, um, Glenn Greenwald made of Noam Chomsky, who is apparently of, still of the view that you should all, cause you know, on, on, on the left, he is of the view that you should always vote for the democratic nominee, no matter who he is, because they're the lesser evil compared to whoever is running as a Republican, which whether you're left or not, um, which Glenn Greenwald is, uh, he, his criticism is still relevant because he disagrees with that. And he says that if you, if you have a large section of the voting population who will vote for the lesser evil, i.e. any Democratic nominee or candidate that comes along, you basically are just, a, you're admitting you have no leverage. It means that you'll bow down to, you know, whatever comes. 
you're not if you're if you don't say that you will hold back your vote in the event that they put someone in front of you who truly does not represent your interests then why should anything change why would you expect to get anyone other than joe biden or hillary clinton or whoever you know nut job <laughs> of a different a uh, nut job, different nut job of the same color that they decide to put in front of you. Like, you shouldn't be surprised that this is the outcome. Uh, once again, I'm not surprised that Tulsi or Bernie ended up being basically the same as all of these fucking establishment politicians. That was another criticism Glenn Greenwald made is that, you know, Bernie has been in government for a really long time. You can't actually expect a politician who is that established to to actually follow through on whatever revolution he claims that he wanted to run if at the end of the day he doesn't want to say anything mean about joe biden because they're friends they're family friends and they have dinner together and you know you can't expect them to do that that's not how it works so i i'm i'm disappointed in tulsi as a person just because i'm always disappointed in people who claim to have principles and then you know for whatever reason, do the exact opposite of that, um, or at least what fits with that. Um, but I am, like, once again, not surprised that politicians are politicians. She yeah. cannot damage that electability next time around, okay? We need the fucking MILF as president. Okay, oh the God. first All right. female Come on now. MILF. Super, like, for sure, she's like a, you know, a powerful woman. And she's one that, yeah, like, I wish that she would use that power in the right way. And it is one of those where you see these uh, same old things. And, you know, this isn't just my second, what, like, I've been in, like, this is the second Bitcoin having I've been through, but also the second election I've been through with Bitcoin. And last time, I remember I was still, like, of the mindset of, like, you know, maybe we could still solve this problem with the right candidates and the right feature set. and We get this thing right. And Dude, there's nothing to man, do with solving anything. I just want a MILF president. Okay, well, shoot. And, like, once it turned out the way it did in 2016, it was almost like I was, like, all in Bitcoin. Where I'm mean, Even before the election, where in 2016, like, once the primaries were done in 2016, it's like, that's it. Dude, like, I want to laugh know. at how, like, a president doing something is magically not okay just because it's a woman now. What? <laughs> anyway, let me get out this thought, okay? And uh, damn it, she now. <laughs> you were all anyway, in 2016. You don't think that would be hilarious to watch Hold the up, media freak up. out me. just because a woman did something? Because I'm going somewhere something. with this, and it's important. <laughs> I'm trying to get something out here. Okay, so like I did go into Bitcoin, and I was like, man, Bitcoin could be the answer. But it's not just Bitcoin. And it's got a lot to do with your network and your ability to discern information and your ability to build out the proper network and the right implementation and doing things right. And that's not exactly always easy. And um, I just wanted to, you know, kind of I'm pivoting this final thought here. If anybody knows this girl that uh, this woman that used to be a, a name in the space named Tony Lane Casserly. And you've seen her out there. Just give her a ping and tell her to like ping the community because she's been gone for over a year now. And uh, she just disappeared from the space. And she was one of those that kind of bought into the crypto. It's like, as long as I got crypto, I'm a sovereign individual. And I'm protected and I'm secure. And I think a lot of people run with that naivety of like, I'm going to solve the world's problems with this easy answer I created in a token. And they run around the wrong characters and they end up in a bad situation and they've been missing now for almost a year or over a year or I guess almost a year now. And uh, it is one of those where it's just like it's, it's upsetting to see that that person disappear like that and nobody uh, and nobody has nobody has brought it up or mentioned anything. And I just want to say, like, if you if you know her, like, I'm not saying she has to come back or dox yourself or anything just like let her family know that she's all right let the community know that she's all right um 
you know, just uh, it's one of those things where I think a lot of people kind of have like this false sense of like there's an easy answer and they just grab it or they vote for it or they push the button and they think that's it. And uh, that's not the case. It's a lot of work involved and you got to be smart and you got to you got to have the right people around you and you got to be uh, thinking you got to have your wits with you. I don't know what the hell is going on with that, but yeah. Yeah, I don't think anybody does, and that's the only reason I'm mentioning her name again. Like uh, her name's Tony Lane Cassery. Like if you've seen her out there, you know her. Just let her know that hey, some people from the you know the Bitcoin scenes like where's this group? like you know they were asking about you. <laughs> so, well, I guess I don't really have a final thought. So I'm gonna just describe a funny thing that I saw on Twitter. Some dude was riding a motorcycle through a park and just smashed a two liter on the ground, cap down, and it rocketed like a hundred feet in the air and he just kept driving and caught it. This is this is cool. That happened. Later, punks. <laughs> Later everyone. Hey, Oh,